Let's do this thing. Lust, because Iggy Pop would have never sung, I've got a love for life. Ladies and gentlemen of the Right Club Nation, members of the Blue Ribbon Panel of Judges, podcast listeners both near and far, when was the last time that someone swept you off your feet? That you met someone who knocked your socks off? That you felt the rush, the charge, that first stage of romance, when was the last time that someone seduced you? Now, not the negative connotations of seduction, that realm of the pickup artist's deceit and manipulation being led astray from one's own true nature by the corrupt, cloudy-headedness of sexual arousal and subsequent conquest, but no, the sweet and simple science of charming someone with an appeal to their refined senses, encouraging them to Take their unfounded fears and let them fall away, enveloping them in comfort, encouraging not sexual submission, but sexual emancipation, the free flowing exchange of fluids and friction, and then perhaps some more fluids. To seduce is in to entice the effortless answer of yes as a response to any question. Now, in this age of internet dating, when one-fifth of all new relationships begin online, and amidst this polyamorous hookup culture, I am willing to bet that some of you are very hungry for it. That intense initial urge, the surge of white-hot heat that comes before the lusty fires fade into smoldering coals and ash of long-lasting love. Now, smile at someone. I mean, it's, that's a good place to start. The act of smiling slowly releases our brain's lust drugs, you know, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. Try it, go ahead and smile. Get a little high on life. Now, turn to someone you find attractive and smile at them. Now make eye contact when you do it. And remember that a genuine smile causes the muscles around the eyes to contract. So smile with your eyes, smize. Now, the person that, you, that you're looking at, they should be smiling back at you, mirroring your facial expression. If they're not, it's time to move on. Better luck next time. <laughs> but if you are lucky, then boom, the magic has begun. Not only are they mirroring your facial expression, but their minds have already begun to mirror your neurochemistry. The chemicals that increase your heart rate and reduce your need for food and sleep. Now, there is a word that I learned recently, acokoinomini. It means coitus without passion, sex without desire, love without lust. Now to think of all the times that this base and mechanical act has been performed without the fire of lust stoking its engines, adding heat and steam to the action of the pump. Now all those many, many times and that, all that while there was this one single word, akokonomini, as clumsy to say as the task is to perform. Now, there is one fundamental difference between the lustful brain of the male and the female, being that the man's modus operandi begins and ends with visual stimulation. Bosom, buttocks, feet, genitals. It's biological. Breast, butt, feet, crotch. Globally, across all cultures. Tits, ass, feet, pussy, cock. Gay or straight? Most men will stand at attention at the simple sight of some cleavage, either boobs or butt. It's as simple as that. Men are as simple as that. However, within this lies man's lusty complication, the contradiction. If a man tells you he wants casual sex, that he's emotionally unavailable, he's actually speaking against the fundamental nature of his biological makeup. The swinging single bachelor is a social construct. Love at first sight, men get that, women don't. Devastated by breakups, again, men statistically tip the stale scales. You may have heard men think about sex every seven seconds. That's ridiculous. Seven, every seven minutes, again, laughable. But I am not too surprised by the tenacity of this masculine myth. According to most studies, men think about sex about 20 times a day. Now, these samples range from one time a day to 388 times in one day. External genitals are to blame, I believe. I mean, the first thing, every day, I wake up and my morning wood has risen with the sun. You know, inviting a, a fisted grip, and it reminds me, is cock too obvious of a word choice in this situation? Well, cock a doodle do. I, I have sexual thoughts before I get out of bed in the morning. I take a piss, I think about sex. I take a shower, I think about sex. I put on a pair of pants. Well, hello there, my little friend. I'm thinking about sex. Show a man the right picture and he becomes a lustful cock monster. 
and his biochemistry will tell him to settle down with it. Now, while men seem predictable in their lust, this stems only from their simplicity. Female lust is a, complicate, uh, is a complex formula, but it is equally formulaic. His book, The Game. Her book, The Rules. The female brain requires a series of cues to become lustful. Is he clean? What's his social status? What has happened in his past? Is he a vampire or a werewolf? Is he kind to his mother? Now, is he actually kind or is he just pretending to be kind? Now, only then can the female begin to be, feel sexually desirable. And now, how do we get women on her back? Uh, well, we look to the paperbacks. Now, just as many women buy romance novels as men buy pornography, it's the same formula released over and over and over again. Only you can tame the wild coconut. Only you, the protagonist, the heroine, the female archetype, the audience's proxy, can take this savage and powerful and virile and hairy but not too hairy man and crack open his thick outer shell, his protective armor which no one else can penetrate, and then receive the sweet, soft, wet reward that awaits you in the tenderest recesses of his emotional core. Then, and only then, do women begin to lust. Unless, of course, they too have been seduced by the lustless society of insta-love, the hookup nation of OK Stupid and that grinder app they made for breeders. I will make you love me, but because we've just met, I won't let you pull my hair and choke me the way I really like. 30 seconds. Uh, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend, Dr. Martin Luther King. But lust is a force capable of transforming a friend into a fuck buddy and then possibly an enemy. Iggy Pop would have never sung I've Got a Love for Life. In fact, in the song Lust for Life, Iggy goes so far as to say something like love, well, that's hypnotizing chicken. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to be a hypnotized chicken when it comes to my most intimate desires. Fuck love. Fuck love. Bear back. Go ask the mouth. Stephen Westall, ladies and gentlemen.